Hi, Eileen. Welcome to the Arthritis Life podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure. Yeah, I wish we could be in person, but this is second best. So can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? You know, where in the world are you and how long have you had rheumatoid arthritis? Well, I live not too far from you, about four hours north in Vancouver, British Columbia, although we're separated by a a border. uh, We're really not that far. Our weather is much the same. Um, And I live with rheumatoid arthritis. I was actually diagnosed almost exactly six years ago, and it's been a journey. Yeah, let's let's start with that. I love hearing people's diagnosis journeys, sometimes known as sagas. So what were your first symptoms and how did you get diagnosed? Well, I can't really quite pinpoint my first symptoms because I started to experience pain um, in kind of multiple areas for a long time and it would come and go. I was usually told that it was just carpal tunnel because I was young. It was around 24 when that started to happen. And I was working as an esthetician, which is quite a physical job. So I was using my hands a lot. I was hunched over a lot. Um, And so that's why uh, having such a repetitive job, I was kind of dismissed um, uh, having any proper tests done um, and I just kept complaining about the pain and eventually you know my family physician at that time was like well wear a wrist brace but I complained how wrist braces were very very uncomfortable especially at night it seemed like my hands and wrists were swelling Um, and then the symptoms really, really progressed during the third trimester of my pregnancy when I was 26 years old. Um, I have never had as bad of swelling before, and they were really worried about preeclampsia with me. Um, And I was experiencing a lot of pain and fatigue. Um, And I was told that all of that would go away after my son was born but it never actually did. In fact, um, I took the year off for maternity leave and that's when I thought that my pain would get better, especially the carpal tunnel, because the number one thing they're going to tell you to do if your carpal tunnel doesn't need surgery is just rest it, stop doing what's aggravating it. So I did stop doing that, but that pain never went away. The swelling never went away. Uh, The fatigue didn't go away. First, I thought maybe I was experiencing, you know, Uh, hormone issues because I just had a baby. Uh, I thought my depression was just postpartum depression, but it was a bit more. The fatigue and then the acne. I had quite a bit of cystic acne and I was constantly hot. It was very easy for me to put on weight. Exercise was very, very difficult for me to do, even though I desperately wanted to lose the baby weight. So there was just a point where I went back to work and Jobs that I used to be able to do quite fast, you know, Brazilian waxes, massage, pedicures, facials, makeup applications, all of those things became extremely painful and I couldn't do them anymore. I also started to get really slow at doing them, started to forget things all the time. And I was also constantly catching infections. I was always sick. So at that point, I was in the back room at my work all the time crying after just one service and I was like this is not carpal tunnel syndrome this is something more now given my family history my aunt had rheumatoid arthritis but I actually really had no idea what arthritis really was even though I had heard that name you know mentioned before but I was just like "Mm, arthritis right it's just joint pain you know and Uh, I learned the hard way and so a coworker was like, well, maybe you should get tested for RA then. I was like, yeah, what, how do you, you know, she's like, oh, I have a friend and it's a blood test. I'm like, okay, I have a point with my family physician. I'm going to ask you about rheumatoid arthritis because that's in my family. And so I went into my family physician's office and I said, can you test me for RA? She said, mm, I don't really see any swelling. You're a bit young, uh, maybe fibromyalgia, but you know, a rheumatologist is the one who has to diagnose that. So we'll send you to one anyways. But when I did see that rheumatologist a little bit a month, then a month later, um, I was diagnosed seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. Wow. And what strikes me as also a mom listening to this is that, you know, your job was so physically demanding that even the demands of having a baby were a break, quote unquote, a break for you. Whereas for many moms uh, who are having joint issues, that's actually a really hard time. So was it hard for you taking care of your son? 
when he yes. was a newborn with your hands? Okay. Yeah. So I right away, I didn't know I had rheumatoid arthritis at the point. He was born a month before I turned 27 and I wasn't diagnosed till I was 29. So it took quite a few years to actually understand that my pain wasn't my misdiagnosis and for me to actually stick up for myself and become that advocate to get my proper diagnosis and also for doctors to listen to me. But it was really alarming to me when I wasn't able to do things that I really wanted to do with my son, like wear him in a baby carrier because it hurt my back and my shoulders and my neck too much. Um, it really bothered me that the fatigue was so intense that sometimes, you know, I had to leave it up to my partner at that time to do the 3 a.m. feedings. It really also bothered me that I couldn't breastfeed because I wasn't able to hold him that long. Uh, my body just hurt. And it, yeah, it hurt too much. Um, and then there was things like taking him in and out of a car seat, anything with buckles or straps. It was just like, I couldn't do, I wasn't strong enough or it was just too painful. And without my diagnosis at that time, people didn't really understand why I wasn't doing some things, especially the breastfeeding part. Um, and that was really kind of a difficult situation because some people can be pretty um, adamant that, you know, breast is best, but it's actually, as long as your child is fed, that's best. Oh my gosh. Yes. I have gone on some rants about that my, myself, but I think that the take home message for anyone listening after you get that validity of your diagnosis, it becomes easier to advocate, right? Because you have quote unquote proof that you have like a legitimate illness, but it's so hard in that pre-diagnosis period to advocate, right? But one of the things I look at as like an occupational therapist is we treat people's function and the, the quote unquote functional deficits or their difficulties with daily tasks, regardless of their diagnosis. So what strikes me is even if you didn't have a diagnosis, all right, even if it was only carpal tunnel or just j diffuse pain of no known origin, you should have gotten some more support in all those areas. But let's, let's go chronological. So then you got your diagnosis. What did it feel like when you got it? Um, well, it was actually a very devastating experience for me because the aunt that I said that also had rheumatoid arthritis, she was, um, she actually passed away the same week that I was diagnosed. Oh my gosh. That was a huge eye opener. And it was a very, very terrifying experience because she was diagnosed mm. 40 or so years ago. So obviously treatments have changed since then. But I saw what rheumatoid arthritis had done to her body and done to her life. And when you're freshly diagnosed and somebody that close to you passes away, it wasn't RA that killed her, but, it, you know, comorbidities definitely had a huge, huge um, impact in eventually what did take her life. But, you know, I never saw her walk, really walk more than just a few steps. Uh, her hands were deformed. And she was always in pain. She was morbidly obese. She had diabetes and everything too. So I, I really saw what that did to her. I also saw how mean family members were because they didn't understand what was going on with her. So it was difficult to be diagnosed with that because the same family members that had kind of hurtful comments towards her were not being supportive to me. And then at the same time, I had just learned how devastating and debilitating rheumatoid arthritis actually is. I admit that I always thought arthritis was, you know, mostly just joint pain happens to the elderly kind of thing. I, I had no idea it was actually an autoimmune disease or the medications involved. So I definitely went through a process, the grief process, uh, denial, bargaining, um, acceptance eventually, but it took a long time to get there. And it was a process to find the right medications that actually did help me um and it was a process for me to actually learn to listen to my doctors um you know I didn't quite understand a lot what they were saying I've never before had to see a doctor so much every time that I was sick before it was always you know it was a quick fix here's some antibiotics here's you know something that you only take for tops two weeks and yeah. you're better um, so this is like something that they're like, well, you got to try this medication for six months to see if it even works for you. And um, so, yeah, the first year or so was incredibly hard for me, um, physically and emotionally, just trying to 
come with reality or my new reality that I was living with this disease. Yeah. And, and so fast forwarding to now, you know, you are such an active patient advocate and you're a writer, you write about your experiences and, and it's only been six years. Is that right? That you've had it? Yes. Yeah. So um, can you maybe explain a little bit like how that uh, transition went from that initial kind of shock and grief to, it seems like I'm going to put words in your mouth, but you're really like you own your rheumatoid arthritis now and you're very active in managing it through things like, you know, exercise and you're a patient advocate and you engage in research. So how did you, what helped you get to where you are today, basically? Uh, I think that I was just incredibly frustrated with people's misconceptions and stigmas around arthritis, chronic illness, and living with an invisible illness. Um, And being typically a very vocal person, I started just complaining on Facebook. And then somebody said, you should become an an advocate or start a blog. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, And I always kind of loved writing, but I never you know, I had never had an outlet or anything special to really write about. I wrote about concert reviews and things like that. But then I started to write down my experiences and it was a very cathartic experience doing that. And doing so actually got me attention really quickly from like Healthline and other, some other publications. And I introduced myself to the Arthritis Society, which is like the Canadian version of the Arthritis Foundation. And that's when I became an ambassador. And I started to really kind of discover what advocacy is all that it entails and that I everything that I was feeling and saying was being reflected on the six million Canadians living with the disease and then also that goes for you know the millions of people in the states living with it or other places too and we're all kind of experiencing the same sorts of things and just hearing how my story and what I was doing was helping others um, just really pushed me forward to keep sharing my story, keep creating uh, awareness for arthritis, writing, like I said, it was very cathartic to me that I just kept practicing, kept writing. And then I stumbled across an opportunity to participate in research and joined the Arthritis Research Canada Patient Advisory Board, which has introduced me to many different um, people living with arthritis and some of the Canada's top scientists and researchers when it comes to this illness. And it's been a, an experience and a half. (laughs) Um, It's how I met you in person at the American college of rheumatology conference. They sent me there. um, And now I'm writing for their newsletter. I get to participate in studies and it's been such a rewarding experience because not only am I helping myself by doing so, but everything that I'm doing is also going into teaching others who are going to be taking care of future arthritis uh, patients or current ones. Um, And it's also helping people understand the disease better. Absolutely. And I I really love that someone gave you the nudge after you, you know, this all started when you posted event thread on Facebook and who among us has not, you know, vented on Facebook before and that you got a nudge from somebody to just start your own blog. And, and that has led you to all these opportunities. And I just encourage anyone listening, you know, to share your story. Cause I've had the same experience you have. I didn't expect anyone to really care about my blog. I did it initially more for just myself as almost like an online diary and thinking, Oh, maybe one or two people, people will find it. But, yeah. um, but yeah, like what are some of, can you, um, share any responses that your audience has had that have really stood out to you or just, you know, general responses you've had to sharing your story on those larger platforms? Well, I'm going to dial back a little bit. When I first started this, my roommate at that time told me no one would care. No one will listen. So that fueled me. Um, and also just, you know, some of the the horrible things that people said about my disease and then also just the ignorance around arthritis. <laughs> um, that fueled me. And then so now I've had so many people listen to me and um like I proved those people really wrong some of I guess like some of the most surprising things that I've gotten out of this is I've had a lot of um different types of researchers or healthcare providers who actually follow my blog or follow me on social media to learn more about arthritis 
I've had rheumatologists thank me for my writing because they have a deeper understanding of the disease or the patient experience. Uh, I've been celebrated uh, local news even about my advocacy. Uh, my blog has been awarded, you know, uh, one of the best arthritis blogs to read, which is something I never expected when I started Amazing. making it. Um, the Canadian Institute of Health Research has even recognized my advocacy. And then, you know, the countless patients that say, uh, thank you for all that I, you know, what we say and everything, it's so worth it. I've even had like an emergency room doctor diagnosed with RA say that my blog has helped her understand, you know, the illness more. Um, and that's like, something very interesting because before she had just a clinician view of it now she's got a living with it so um even though I don't have a medical background my writing is still able to help others for me being trained as an occupational therapist health provider not like a physician provider but you know sometimes the textbooks can be so dry and even when they try to they they try you know they put little boxes like here's the patient's story but there's nothing like hearing it from someone's um, real, like from the actual person sharing what it really means to you to navigate this disease, you know, as a single mom and as somebody trying to balance her career, you know, your initial career as an esthetician and now finding, figuring out how you can, you know, support yourself and work while managing this condition. How has your experience participating in research to help you kind of learn how to manage your day-to-day -day of your rheumatoid arthritis? Um, speaking about what actually entails in arthritis research is a bit tricky because there's so many different things that studies can um, be studying and different types of studying. But mainly, uh, I'll talk about a couple of the studies that particularly have really helped me. And uh, These are all through Arthritis Research Canada. In particular, I participated in a study where they were using a Fitbit and the app that they developed to help people with rheumatoid arthritis better understand their disease by health tracking. And so that particular study was led by Dr. Linda Lee, who was also my physiotherapist. So we have a, we have a close bond, I would say. And that particular study was really interesting because I started it on my 33rd birthday. So it was exciting for me to kind of looking forward to tracking my health and trying to get, you know, healthier starting, you know, when I'm turning 33, but at that point I've been living with the disease for four years. Didn't quite understand it as best as I do now. Cause it's, it, it takes years to understand this. I'm still learning today. And also I had just started another medication a few months prior. Uh, and so I wanted to know if that medication was working. I was also exercising, but I didn't know where to turn to, to anyone that actually knew about exercise and rheumatoid arthritis. Because when you go to a personal trainer or just any physiotherapist, you don't know how much knowledge they actually have about arthritis until you ask them. And not all physiotherapists are created equal. It's always best to look for somebody who has the advanced training. And personal trainers typically don't know how to help somebody living with a disability. And so that's why I was really particularly excited about the study. So it was to examine how my physical activity in the day impacted my symptoms. Uh, while wearing the Fitbit, I made a step goal of 10,000 steps a day, which is actually quite a bit. And um, at first, you know, it took time to get used to that and tr I build myself up so I could see myself in the little grass through the app, uh, the Opera's app. Uh, as I would do my steps, my physical activity, and how that would impact my sleep, how it would impact my fatigue, my pain, my mood, my stress. And then I could also take notes in the journal. So if I had appointments or infusion dates or things like that, I could see like how long actually I was, you know, left in that kind of hangover, medication hangover state. Or I could see little things like how when my period came up, how it would impact my pain levels, my fatigue or my sleep. I could also see things like how my sleep would impact my fatigue through the day. I could typically see how long I needed to rest in order to feel refreshed. It's two hours. And then I was able to just track a number of things like my medications and see that over time, yes, it was working. My pain was going down. My physical activity was going up. My fatigue was going down. And then I was able to also catch things when they were starting to go wrong. Particularly, was even after the study was finished, I kept doing the health tracking because it's so beneficial. And I was able to catch that 
uh, my pain was going for too long, in particular for three weeks or more. Um, and it was developing new kinds of pains and things like that. And that's when we were able to kind of see that I had um, a rare copper deficiency and that how much that was impacting. So once again, I went back to health tracking when I started my vitamin supplementcy and see how that improved my symptoms over time. And because I had so many questions about if physical activity was good for me with RA, um, particularly like, am I overdoing it? It was able to see what on those days, how much I would do to actually be overdoing it and how much time I would need to generally recruit after it. And I would actually see kind of weird patterns where it's necessarily, I would have one day I may overdo it. Um, for example, like I walked the, the Vancouver seawall, it, it was just over 27,000 steps. Uh, I can't remember how many kilometers or miles that was, but it was a, it was a long walk. And it wasn't the next day after that I felt it was actually two days after. And I started to notice patterns like that with tracking my health. And so participating, particularly that study taught me so much about my rheumatoid arthritis. And it gave me uh, some reassurance on like how physical activity is actually really great for us. Yeah. And I think this is one of the most confusing areas. Well, first of all, just learning how to track because it can feel so overwhelming because there's so many different factors, but you're still right. Having a format, whether it's an app or a physical journal to just write it all out that even just the process, right. Can help mm -hmm. you start seeing those patterns. Like, Oh yeah. When I slept for only six hours, then it was, I, my exercise tolerance was a lot less the next day, but then when I slept better, it wasn't. But the other thing is figuring out that what I call it, just the sweet spot for exercise complicated because right. It's like, how much are you pushing your cardio versus how much are you pushing your muscles? So can you ex maybe explain to the audience a little bit, what kinds of exercise are you, have you found work for you and what amount, how do you break that down? Okay. So I'm going to go back to another study that I participated with arthritis mm -hmm. research Canada. Um, and this was a study that was on strength training for those with rheumatoid arthritis. And it was kind of really focused on the barriers that was coming up for people with RA and why they weren't strength training, because quite a few with RA actually don't strength train despite the massive amounts of benefits that come from it. And so I met with an Arthritis Research Canada researcher who is also a kinesiologist, and we talked about all those barriers like fatigue, memory, pain, um, motivation, depression, anxiety, not knowing how, fear of pain. There was actually quite a few different barriers. And so over time, I worked with her on how to kind of chip away at those barriers and um, kind of because she has special knowledge in pe uh, helping people with disabilities become active through experience, you know, advanced training, she was able to, you know, come to my gym, kind of show me what exercise is good and give me tips. So I learned things like if I strength train before I do cardio, it's actually a lot easier because I'm not dealing with as much muscle fatigue that way. And that was something that I was doing completely wrong because at the gym that I was going to, the cardio room was before the weight room, you know? And so, um, I would just go to the cardio room first and then I wasn't really good or hurting myself while I was strength training. And she also pointed out to me that, um, you know, I would complain about how not every day is the same. And so she's like, well, then don't have just one workout, have two, have one for the good days and then have one for the not so good days because the key is motion is lotion. It's just, as long as you're moving your body in a way that you actually enjoy doing, even if it's light, you know, low impact movements, it's better than just sitting there doing nothing. She was also able to teach me simple things like uh, using resistance bands versus the heavier weights when I'm in a flare because they're not going to be so heavy on my joints. And um, it was just reassuring to talk to somebody who actually knew how somebody with a disability is going to exercise. Uh, even her just telling me, she's like, a lot of my patients smoke a joint before they come to their exercise class because it's the only way they can uh, make it to the exercise class, you know? And it was just so reassuring, you know, and that it's like, okay, I kind of might do that sometimes uh, and I'm not alone. It's just those little things that if they help us get moving, it's wonders. Um, and another huge, huge point that I learned while participating in research is physical activity doesn't necessarily have to look like 
you know, 30 minutes of strength training, do 50 squats, some lunges, some planking, and then a bunch of arm moves. Um, it could also look like gardening. It could look like yoga. It could look like Pilates or Zumba or dancing or even just stretching and moving your body around. It can be badminton. Uh, it could be cleaning your house. And it doesn't need to always, you know, be the elliptical. Uh, it could be just going for a 30 minute walk. And you don't need to actually do it all at once. You can split it up throughout the day. So if you can't really tolerate 30 minutes standing or walking on your feet, then just do 10 minutes and slowly build it up over time. That's so true. I know a lot of people in the I guess, exercise community lately have been saying, you know, to really emphasize movement over exercise, because there's a lot of baggage connected to the word exercise. Um, And so I love that idea of just saying movement, you know, and yeah, I loved your examples, gardening, dancing, you know, taking the dog on a walk. And it was interesting. I actually saw on Twitter the other day, a doctor had said that their patient had, um, requested that they amend the note from the appointment because the patient said that they take their dog on a walk every day and the doctor had written that they don't do any exercise. And the doctor was saying uh, kind of derogatory towards the patient, like that's not real exercise. And that's like so against what all the, you know, the community of like, I know physiotherapists, occupational therapists, I'm not going to say everyone to a last T is saying that, but that you know, really respecting that movement is the goal and not making it have to be this formal exercise at the gym, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but I, am glad you, you separated things into strength and cardio. Sometimes what you're doing is helping both, right? Like, like for me, stairs are a good example or elliptical. You're definitely getting some muscle, you know, strength. I can definitely feel those in my quads. Um, or, but others, other times you can do an exercise. It's kind of like really like, like exercise bands don't get your cardio up too much or resistance bands, but they get the strengthening. So I think a lot of times if one of those is more intimidating to you than the other, maybe start if you, with the one that's less intimidating, right? Like if you're like overwhelmed with the thought of taking a long walk because of the cardio demands and the breathing, then start with resistance bands and do something or just even not even bands. You can do a wall sit in your own home, you know, put your back against the wall, bend your knees and try to hold that for 20 seconds. Even, you know, mm-hmm. there's so many things you can do. And I know you've talked about missing your gym right now because the pandemic, are you doing your exercises at home now or your movements? Uh, Sorry. Yeah. So I, during the pandemic, I, I knew that not having access to my gym and my self-management skills was going to definitely cause an impact in my pain, considering how much pain relief I do actually get out of regular exercise. Um, So yes, my pain levels definitely went up when I became more sedentary and have less things going on. Uh, And during the winter was really, really difficult because it's cold, it's rainy, I didn't want to go outside so much, my motivation's low, my depression's up. Um, But now that the sun is out again, um, I love to go for walks. I like just going to explore my neighborhood. Um, that vitamin D out there is so good for us. The heat on my, it feels so good on my arthritis, especially since it's not too hot yet. <laughs> and yeah, so I've started doing a lot of exercises at home. I did buy a treadmill. Uh, one particular reason I wanted a treadmill is because it has a upright angle. So that's actually really good for strengthening your muscles to make going upstairs easier or going hiking easier. Um, And I like doing that on the treadmill versus actually a real hill because going down is more painful than actually going up the hill. And it was a really, really good workout. I didn't need to run doing it, but I would work up a really good sweat. And but I don't use it as much because I don't have the social pressure that the gym has. And I would also go into the sauna after the, you know, my exercise at the gym where I typically was doing the elliptical because it was a low impact exercise. And at that time, um, that's really what I needed because I wasn't able to the treadmill until I lowered my inflammation and my meds started working a bit better. Um, And also medic, uh, the exercise too, because exercise is proven to lower inflammation. So you also have to ask yourself, how much inflammation does my body have? How easy is it to trigger that inflammation? That's where health tracking can come really, really handy too, because you can kind of typically tell when you've overdone it and you can maybe check, oh, I've done 
9,000 steps today. I've overdone it. I need to take a break. I really triggered my fatigue last weekend after a hike and a hike is not a normal activity, you know, for us. And it was one of the nice sun first sunny days. And I got a little too ambitious and I went from my normal amount of exercises, like 30 minutes a day on the exercise bike. And then we did a two and a half hour hike and like, doesn't take a genius to predict that that would be too much, right? That's too, yeah. too much. But I was going to add and reminded me to ask you about fatigue, because this is one of the little known benefits of exercise is actually potentially helping your fatigue so long as you don't go completely overboard like I did and overdo it and trigger your fatigue to be worse. So do you mm -hmm. find your, if you have that good amount of exercise, like whatever that is defined for you, it does it help with your fatigue as well? Absolutely. So when I restart an exercise routine, say after I've gone through a flare, I've missed a bit for exercise, typically about three weeks, everything kind of becomes horrible again if I've you know not exercising regularly um, I do find that it will take me a couple of weeks to reboot myself rejuvenate myself and so exercise for the first few weeks typically two weeks um, kind of sucks you know you might get a little bit more pain you and you're definitely going to get some more fatigue and then when you have more fatigue you're going to have more malaise and more brain fog right so yes, the first two weeks kind of suck. You're going to be tired after. I found like after exercise, that's when I would need a nap the first couple weeks. However, once you get over that initial bump, that's when you're just like, wow, I feel so much better. I feel so much energized. You and you'll, you'll actually start to notice pretty soon that you're, you're sleeping better. Uh, exercise really, really helps people sleep better as long as they're not doing it too close to bedtime. Uh, after a while, I do definitely notice that fatigue, uh, my fatigue levels really, really lower when I do exercise regularly, as long as I'm not overdoing it. I love to go for hikes every once in a while, usually on a Sunday kind of thing, and I overdo it. But, um, you know, I don't want to not do something and get to see beautiful views because of my illness, uh, you just kind of need to sometimes plan around it. Yes, absolutely. And, and decide which trade-offs are worthwhile for you, you know, especially mm -hmm. um, in the olden days when we used to travel, you know, for example, when we went to Disneyland, I knew I was going to need a few days to recover after yeah. Disneyland, even with a nap every day. I just, it, you know, we want to maximize what we could do there. So, but I was going to also ask, you've mentioned a few different times about mental health. Sorry, just to switch gears, because I don't want to forget to ask. Um, you know, I'm so appreciate how open you've been about mental health and in general, plus balancing the way that having a chronic inflammatory illness like rheumatoid arthritis can affect your mental health. Is there anything you'd like to share with the audience about your own journey and how to, how you've managed you know, symptoms of depression and anxiety with having rheumatoid arthritis? Yeah, um, definitely have a lot to say about mental health and RA or just mental health on its own. I was actually diagnosed at 17 with clinical depression. But back then, uh, we're talking early 2000s. Um, I was just told to lose 10 pounds by my family doctor and oh call a psychiatrist if I need one, no referral. <laughs> and so that's really, really not good advice to a 17 year old girl who is going through um, anxiety and depression and has no clue what it is. So I hit that diagnosis in shame for a long time. You know, I'd go through boyfriends and they'd be like, you're crazy and things like that and feel worse. It was eventually my rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis was when I actually re-examined my mental health and it made me come to terms that, yeah, I, I do have mental health problems. I have anxiety. I have depression. It's time to take control of that. And since my diagnosis, I've definitely noticed that there is a, uh, a huge connection between the two. If something bothers me, I, my fatigue goes right up. And when my feet goes up and I'm not able to do things, stress goes up, bad sleep, and then pain goes up. And it's, it's a vicious cycle. Yes. Same thing when my pain is up and I can't do things and I get more depressed and I get overwhelmed because things are piling up and I'm a mom. So that's really hard to go through sometimes, um, you know, just, uh, 
it seems like if my stress is high up, it's like my body doesn't want to move. There's a wall there and I just sit there and I'm like, I can't figure out what to do, <laughs> but panic inside. <laughs> if I have a bad day, uh, emotionally, I'm going to need a long nap that day. My, it's just, it takes a lot out of me. Um, and I know that I'm not alone because I, like I said, participating in different research studies and keeping up to date with research. There's so many people who have different forms of inflammatory arthritis that are dealing with depression and anxiety as well. And for those that aren't, I, I really wonder how they do it. <laughs> are there any coping tools that you've learned either on your own or in therapy that have helped you in, in those moments? Yeah, well, I think writing for sure. Absolutely. Writing has definitely helped me. It's kind of helped me process all my thoughts, come up with an action plan, uh, help others be productive. I also love to paint. Um, I love to cook, uh, uh, garden, my cats, my kid. And then, of course, I do take medication. I've seen a clinical social worker. I've seen a psychiatrist. Um uh, meditation also can help if you know I feel like I'm going through a panic attack just laying there and doing some deep breathing um, can really help I was even just like letting it out like sometimes you just gotta scream you gotta cry you gotta complain swear whatever just sometimes letting it out or just talking through it and having you know somebody being supportive can make a huge impact and then me being me it's just I find a lot of relief in just tackling what I need to get done. I sometimes it's really hard to do through symptoms, but just doing it little bit by little bit and kind of being kind to myself um, really helps. I have to recognize that I am going through an illness and I try to not compare myself to others. I'm just me. <laughs> I find it much easier to be compassionate towards others than self-compassionate sometimes, you know? So mm -hmm. I so resonate with that. And you mentioned your son. Um, I know that people are going to want to know, you know, you got your diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis when your son was two years old. Um, it's probably hard to summarize what it's, how it's affected your journey as a parent, but is there anything you'd want to share about being a parent with rheumatoid arthritis or message to others who are balancing their disease and parenthood? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another Another mention of don't compare yourself to others, for sure. Do not yes. compare yourself to the soccer mom that can, you know, bake amazing cookies and has a ton of energy and, you know, three, four kids and all that. Uh, you just need to focus on yourself and your child and what's best for you because uh, it's your family, you know, forget others. <laughs> um, and yeah. even though my child, like I've had to deal with chronic illness, basically my entire time being a mom it has taught my son lessons that he probably wouldn't have gotten um, if he didn't you know go through a lot of what I've had to go through and um, bringing him along to I take him to all the charity events you know the walk for arthritis he's seen me on tv um, you know he's been there on tv and my uh, filming with me and things like that and he's come to all my doctor appointments and so he has a really big, deep understanding of people with disabilities. People are different. Everybody has different abilities. Um, he's come to be such a compassionate little guy who really understands arthritis. Um, he said things like, I remember one time somebody said, oh, but you don't work to me. And I was kind of complaining about it. He's like, well, yeah, mom, you don't work. You have arthritis. And, you know, just like reassuring little comments. Yeah if I need to grab something, he goes, Oh, you know, mom, don't get up. I'm going to get it for you. You have arthritis, like you rest <laughs> kind of things like that. Wow. And actually my most read blog post was written by him, which is really oh, cute. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. He's very, he is, however, very sensitive to like bullying um, and those kind of things. Uh, however, he, when he does see students getting bullied for things, like particularly he has a friend who's kind of covered in eczema. They're in the third grade. So that friend can get bullied and things like that. Jacob sticks up for him. Um, his favorite t-shirt is, you know, the walk for arthritis t-shirts. <laughs> He's my little cheerleader. And that's not something that I really ever expected. I thought in the beginning of my diagnosis, I was going to be a disappointing bad mother. I can't do this because of my illness, but it's actually probably made me a better mom. 
Wow. Can you, can you say more about that? Like what other ways has it made you, do you think a better mom? Well, I guess it's rearranged my priorities. <laughs> That's for sure. You know, before my mm-hmm. diagnosis, I was I was total metalhead. I think was going to concerts. Uh, I made band merch. I dated a guy in a band that was a total jerk. <laughs> now I, you know, I love going to concerts and things, but I've just separated myself from that scene, which was actually really kind of toxic. Um, so I have different focuses. I focus more on my health now. Um, and I think it's just made me more understanding and more compassionate and more, you know, empathetic towards others emotions um even if I may have been that way before but it's really made me more in tune to how people are doing how ways that I can help also to kind of just do what's best for us because before maybe I was comparing myself to too many other moms or um wondering you know why am I not like this person but it's just kind of it's made me me rather than what other people want me to be Totally. And I think one of the things that came up in my interview with um, Jamie on the previous podcast episode is we also have to be careful not to compare our current selves to what we imagine our self, current self would be if we didn't have rheumatoid arthritis. Because that's actually, I don't know if you've ever done that, but I sometimes I'm like, oh, if I didn't have rheumatoid arthritis, I would be a better mom in this way. Or if I didn't have rheumatoid arthritis, I'd be able to do this with my son. And that can be a really dangerous road to go down because this is the only life we have, right? You don't get the option to turn back the clock or, you know, turn back your body and not have this disease. So do you ever have a struggle to compare your current self to this imaginary self? I call it like the shadow self, the shadow me, like, cause I am, I'm the soccer mom type. Like I'm totally the, you know, my, my inborn personality is like get gold stars, get approval <laughs> from everyone. Like there's things that are really not good about that mentality either. I've had to learn to let go of my perfectionism and it's actually been really freeing. When I remember before my diagnosis, um, I wasn't nearly as motivated uh, because I was, I was also dealing with the untreated depression. So I, I sometimes get a little sad that I didn't get treatment early enough because I think of all the things that I could have done if I wasn't dealing with depression, like holding me back, you know, would I've gone to university, would I've done better in school? Um, you know, where would I be? But I just, I try not to think of that because I'm not the only person who's been diagnosed with a chronic illness. This, this happens, right? Um, and it's just, it's up to you what you want to do with it mm-hmm. in the end and what you can. And yeah, I have to let go of some of that perfection for sure. Like you've mentioned um, and let go of the what ifs and just spoken on the what now, what's going on tomorrow kind of thing. I love that. Let go of the what ifs and focus on the what now. I feel like we need to put that on a t-shirt. I love that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. I want to make sure I'm respecting your time. So I'm going to start wrapping it up. Um, is there anything more you wanted to say about advocacy as a patient? Um, sometimes people hear the word advocacy. They think it has to be formal advocacy, like going to my state capital or my national capital, which I know we've both done that kind of thing. But is there anything more you want to say about kind of broadly um, advocacy as a patient? There's just so many different forms of advocacy out there. And it's um, no patient has to fit a specific mold. Um, Whichever advocacy form that person is passionate about feels comfortable with and feels at place with then like, do it. Uh, There's like really no harm in sharing your story even if it's you know just talking about it on your private Facebook to being on the news talking about it uh, or lobbying you know um, with the government or participating in research or fundraising there's so many different things to do Um, it's just you know trying to find where to start Yeah. And even in the context of just one doctor appointment, something I've started doing recently is trying, trying to stop. I've started stopping apologizing for my symptoms. I used to always apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to ask about this. I'm sorry. And I, I'm like, 
stop. Like I didn't ask for this and their job is to help me. I'm wasting time by hedge. You know, and it's, a, it's kind of like a female thing that we're socialized, yep. that we are socialized as females to have to feel like we have to apologize constantly. So yeah, little Especially things as a Canadian. And is there anything else um, you didn't get a chance to say that you'd like to say to the audience? Yeah. Well, if they're interested in participating in research, then there's a number of ways they can. Um, they can go to creakyjoints.org and find out different ways. They also have the Arthritis Power app, which is great for tracking their symptoms for those in the States. Or they, anyone with inflammatory arthritis can actually start tracking their health through operas at the arthritisresearchcanada.ca website. Or if they're looking into getting to, into advocacy, they can either contact like the Arthritis Foundation local chapter, Arthritis Society local chapter, or they can also keep up to date with research studies that are being done throughout the American College of Rheumatology or local universities. Um, checking on regular Facebook groups that you follow will have different opportunities for those wanting to get involved as well. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so, so much for your time today. And I will be putting links in the show notes to the specific articles you mentioned, like Jacob's blog post on your blog and also the Arthritis Research Canada and the other opportunities you mentioned. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.